The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Refining RCC Management Across the Disease Continuum, an expert clinical consult on leveraging new evidence and novel therapeutic strategies to personalize patient care. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash TJS 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Here we are. I'm Tony Schwery from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Pleased to have you all and welcome Dr. Monty Pal from City of Hope and Dr. Tian Zhang from UT Southwestern. So this is an RCC program here to refine the RCC management across the disease continuum. So uh, we're going to discuss the recent advancement in the adjuvant disease. So last time we were here, ASCO uh, 2019, there was nothing like that. This will not be even a topic. Now it's one third and, and, maybe, and maybe more. We're going to discuss the first line treatment in metastatic RCC with Dr. Paul. And then at the end, Dr. Zhang is going to speak about the refractory disease. Hopefully, we will have half an hour, 20-minute uh, presentation. I usually go over time. And a uh, 10-minute discussion. So let's start by talking a bit about what's happening in the adjuvant setting in renal cell carcinoma. A lot of things, including one of the major phase three studies. So patient with um, RCC, with localized RCC, actually... Um, do have or did have limited uh, options. We have been successful in many uh, tumors, but not in renal cell carcinoma. Uh, the standard have been a nephrectomy, whether, uh, whether a partial nephrectomy or a radical nephrectomy. Uh, so uh, no, um, no preoperative or postoperative therapies in renal cell cancer until uh, recently that we have options the past couple of years for high-risk localized uh, RCC after surgery. Uh, now let's start talking about the neoadjuvant setting. Unfortunately, for good or bad, unlike another tumor we do, the three of us here, bladder cancer, where a lot of the studies have been this um, powered study in, that in the neoadjuvant study, in the neoadjuvant setting, this has not been the case in renal cell cancer. You can look here, you don't see any phase three trial. These are the phase two clinical trial in the neoadjuvant setting. The most recent one, I don't wanna go back to the era of the <laughs> cytokine anymore and get you something from the, uh, from the 90s, but those are the, uh, some of the ongoing uh, studies that uh, we put them, essentially with TKIs, more of the novel TKI here, uh, cabozentinib, um, another TKI, cetravatinib plus nivolumab, axitinib avilumab, which was presented um, the past ASCO GU by Dr. Axel Bax, Len Pembro ongoing, and um, uh, Cabo Nivo. And as you can see, there isn't uh, much consistency in the primary endpoint. This is not PFS and OS, the, the usual ones in the metastatic setting, or DFS. It's around responses. And even it varies between an overall response rate, PR plus CR, CR or uh, PR. Now the question here we ask ourselves, how do we balance the benefit risk in the adjuvant setting? What is the proven risk? Because we know always in adjuvant setting, in any, any disease, any solid tumor, we are for sure over treating. And when you get treatment, there is toxicity. So toxicity and convenience and cost of the treatment versus uh, the benefit. So um, we know that in 2017, the FDA approved, not the EMA, one year of sunitinib in the adjuvant setting. The use of sunitinib, at least you know, in the United States, it has been really minimal because of the limited benefit despite the disease-free survival on independent center review. We know the overall survival. We know the toxicity. We know the uh, investigator assessment of DFS that were uh, negative uh, overall. So this is the abstract, just going into details because it's an improved therapy. Uh, on your left, you see the disease-free survival on independent uh, center review that was positive after a long follow-up. Uh, still, this is an important study that was positive. I know Dr. Taylor uh, got involved in it. The overall survival, you know, 
was not detrimental, but was negative. And still in the U.S., um, this has not really uh, picked up. And um, why is that? Because that's in the background of other studies using targeted therapies, including uh, sunitinib, certainly slightly different, uh, uh, different uh, setting in a way of inclusion criteria, different uh, diseases a bit, but also a different schedule, different starting dose. And most recently, Dr. Ryan presented the result from the long-awaited Everett study, which is a year of, <clears throat> a year of Everolimus versus placebo. That study initially had a high discontinuation rate. So the number of patients, <clears throat> the sample size increased from 1,100 to 1,400. The primary endpoint was um, disease-free survival, relapse-free survival. And as we've seen here, uh, the primary endpoint was narrowly missed, probably by few events. The p-value, that's what I remember, that needed to declare the study as positive for uh, the disease-free survival and relapse-free survival endpoint was supposed to be 0.022 and end up being 0.025. Now, on the other hand, the toxicities um, were um, higher, obviously, after a year of everolimus, and the overall survival was negative with an overall survival hazard ratio of uh, 0.9. So the toxicity issues um, remain both with sunitimab and now with everolimus, a problem leading to treatment discontinuation. And when in the adjuvant setting you have a surgery that in not so minority of patients that are curative and you're taking a therapy for a year, toxicity becomes very important. And when the new therapeutic uh, options are here, these therapeutic options, you know, need to balance the benefit in terms of efficacy and toxicity. So these are the phase three adjuvant trial with immune checkpoint inhibitor that we're gonna go through. My life is easy because I'm gonna discuss mostly one. Uh, the other ones that are either finished accrual, finishing accrual, uh, or uh, has been announced as uh, potentially not meeting their primary endpoint. We're not gonna discuss them much, but to remember, the Emotion 010 is a year of atezolizumab with patients at high risk of recurrence. And I'm not going to go into major details to define what are the patients. These are not just stage one low-grade patients. These are patients at higher risk of recurrence. And you're going to see definition between intermediate high, high, very high, that are extremely heterogeneous, and that's one part of the problem. I just saw Dr. Ryan presenting, um, presenting uh, Everest, and in the same risk group, which are modified US, uh, UCLA risk group, uh, patients that had T3, grade three, were called very high risk, as well as N plus resected patient, where the cancer has metastasized to the lymph node and removed, were called very high risk. A and we know the risk is not the same. Um, so these are the studies, Emotion 010, one year of uh, atezolizumab, Keynote 564, one year of pembrolizumab. We're going to discuss it. The PROSPER study, interesting design, supported by a lot of patient advocates, by cooperative group. We were part of it, which gives nivolumab, neoadjuvant, two cycles, followed by adjuvant nivolumab. The rampart that uses uh, CTLA-4 and PD-1 inhibition here in a three-arm study, and uh, Checkmate 914, which uses nivolumab, nivolumab, and ipilimumab, or placebo, and that study has finished accrual. So Keynote 564 is the study that was presented a year ago virtually. I had the honor to present it during the plenary session. It was the first immunotherapy positive study in renal cell cancer. These are the results. We have updated the results since at ASCO GU with six more uh, months of um, uh, follow-up. Uh, this is the 24 months rate, a difference of 11%, an absolute difference of 11% in disease-free uh, survival. Now, a key secondary endpoint that is not mature, we had initially 25% of event, and the update six months later, we still had 33% of event. And after a year, 
uh, the curves start to separate with you know, less than 5% difference in overall um, survival, uh, absolute. The p-value that sounds significant to you, less than 0 0.05, but at that time, if you put you know, everything together and you have a, a condition to meet statistical significance, when you don't have all the event, this is not statistical significance. So this is in, uh, data is not yet uh, mature here. Now the safety, of course, you're giving one year of pembrolizumab. I would say, for whoever used pembrolizumab in metastatic disease, in any tumor, this was not really different in terms of all grade immune-related event. The immune-related event you can see mostly around hypo and hyper uh, thyroidism while managed, of course, from time to time. You may have some of these devastating immune-related AAEs. Luckily, there was no death on study related uh, to study drug, no grade five toxicities. But from time to time, uh, you know, you can see pneumonitis, you can see hepatitis, needing steroid use, sometimes hospitalization. Uh, the steroid use, high-dose steroid, the equivalent of prednisone 40 milligram or more, was around 7% in this study. So again, it's all balancing the toxicity, the risk-benefit ratio here with the toxicity efficacy. And just before Thanksgiving 2021, the FDA decided to approve pembrolizumab in the adjuvant uh, setting in these patients. And who are these patients that we have enrolled? These are patients that have T2, grade 4, or sarcomatoid, patients that have T3, these together we have called based on our, based on consensus we had, since there is no consensus in the literature, we have called intermediate high. Uh, the patient that have not positive or T4 were called high. And then an unmet medical need to a degree that we have trial now in the TKI era that addressed this unmet need is this M1 NED patient with resected metastatic disease. The scans are fine. These are all, this was the third subset we included on Keynote 564. Now, the majority of patients ended up 86%. Uh, not and positive, not very high risk T4 and plus M1 uh, NED. And if you take these out, the hazard ratio for disease-free survival in the last update we had at ASCO GU this year was 0 0.68. Now checkmate 914. That is the design. Checkmate 914. The difference is six months of therapy. It started with six months of nevo epi, low dose epi here. This is not melanoma, one mg per kg versus placebo. And then the nevo arm, single agent, was added. The study is powered to compare each experimental arm to the placebo. This is the PROSPER study, over 800 patients, where uh, you give neoadjuvant nivolumab for two cycles surgery, then adjuvant nivolumab. The difference here between the two studies I showed is the fact that this study allowed non-clear cell. Of course, it's the clinical staging, which we have a lot of discordance here, so you randomize the patient you know, at the beginning. Uh, and it's patient that had, as I said, non-clear cell histology. And then you continue adjuvant nivolumab. I wish this study had an arm of adjuvant without nivol uh, without. Uh, neoadjuvant. And this study, during the IUA, it was announced that it didn't meet uh, its primary endpoint. The idea behind nivolumab, um, neoadjuvant or checkpoint inhibitor, is, is not strange to all of us from the melanoma and the lung cancer literature. It's about if you really need to develop this immune response and this vast repertoire against all these uh, neoantigen there, it's better to do it when, the, when all the neoantigen are there in the primary, rather at the level of the microscopic disease after you take the kidney out. Very interesting with a lot of preclinical rationale. Now, how's the future going to be? What is the next adjuvant studies? We're working on many. Uh, Dina Battle is helping us as a representative on Alliance and the cooperative group. We're working on something. We want to bring something we all agree on. In the interim, building on uh, pembrolizumab, Merck has launched this study we're involved with, uh, where uh, adding to pembrolizumab control at that time, uh, 
uh, the HIF2 inhibitor. The HIF2 inhibitor, belzotifan, that drug is not approved in renal cell cancer. There's a phase three trial that uh, in metastatic disease that finish accrual, but there is data uh, from a phase one, two study that showed response rate in the refractory setting is around 25%. This is a very important target that led in part to the 2019 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine to my mentor, uh, Bill Kalin, in addition to two other um, uh, gentlemen. Uh, and uh, the drug, the interesting thing about it, it's, it's well tolerated, which makes it quite you know, favorable for an adjuvant setting. Anemia and hypoxia are the thing you need to look at, uh, at least the first one. So now this is very important, and we should always think about the surveys, and Dina Battle have done a wonderful job with KCQ, hundreds and hundreds. I believe one survey I read, like over a 1,000 pages or 1,000 responses, never seen anything like this. So what are the patient perspective? Like, it's great for us to have these questionnaire, quality of life, do the toxicities, everything. At the end of the day, I'm not getting the drug, okay? So... What do patients want in terms of adjuvant therapy? So uh, Casey Cure launched this uh, survey uh, with question, uh, if you get treatment, prevent recurrence, your kidney cancer, what is important for you? Is it toxicity? Is it preventing recurrence, et cetera? And the results are um, king here. Patients are willing to use adjuvant therapy if the treatment prolonged either, uh, either uh, overall survival or disease for survival. While toxicity is less important to patient than efficacy endpoint. This is what patients are, are saying. Now, was that surprising to many of us? I, I, I don't know. I talk to my patient, but of course I don't see, you know, this is a survey of hundreds of patients. I don't see them. But toxicity remains important. Efficacy, efficacy, efficacy. And I would love to see overall survival, you know. Um, you know, personally. Now, the fear of cancer recurrence, I think it's very, very important. We don't talk about that. I think the quality of life metric, Dina, do not capture that well. There are some questionnaire, some question, but it's buried in this whole FKSI 19, you know, etc. So the provider should be aware of patient perspective to know that they may be contributing uh, to patient decision about uh, therapy's um, you know, choice and how the emotional well-being you know, play, uh, play here. Now, let, let's start. I hope you soaked, you absorbed everything in. I know how I feel after I eat and how my eyes start you know, going. So now, let, 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 let's start. I'm going to you know, start this case. So this is a case of the adjuvant setting um, Kevin, 62-year-old uh, gentleman, present with nausea, fatigue, and weight loss. A scan was done, and a large kidney mass, 10 centimeter left kidney mass, um, was seen. Of course, he goes uh, to Dr. Shaler, directly takes direct flight to um, in Munich, and you know, 10 centimeter, many surgeons would have done a radical nephrectomy. He says no. No, I can do it. I can have a partial nephrectomy. He does a partial nephrectomy, negative margins, and he go have a beer and watch a game. Uh, and uh, uh, the pathology comes back. He does a beautiful lymph node dissection, and the pathology come back as PT2 N1. So this is positive, but the you know margins negative. Uh, outpatient? Are we going to say Michael outpatient? My, overnight, overnight. In the hospital, patient recovers well, and first surgical imaging is completely clear. So this is a PT2 N+. Plus. So if you put that in Keynote 564, this is not the M1 NED, not the intermediate high and high risk. Now let's ask first um, um, the, the cool person on, on my left without tie. So Monty, um, <laughs> the questions are coming. Would you, you know, Michael is a, is a great surgeon, and he said, Terrific. this is negative, yes, is N positive, but this was a T2, it didn't go into, what, what would you do? Yeah, no, and, and completely <laughs> agree, fantastic surgeon, no <laughs> doubt. I think your presentation was pretty compelling, though, so I'd certainly want to review the data from Keynote 564 with them, being node positive, having a modest risk for recurrence. You know, I definitely think that it would be a patient where I'd want to consider adjuvant pembrolizumab. Uh, Dr. Shank, would you consider that? Right. I, I mean, it would fit the, certainly the characteristics of patients on Keynote 564. 
Um, Dr. Staler may have told him I got it all out, but you know we know that node positive patients um, technically are at high risk. So I would at least have a conversation. Yeah. Well, you know, let me tell you something. Dr. Staler called you. He referred the patient to both of you. He said, "Get two opinions." So the patient flies to California, then to Texas, and asks you, how do patients fare with toxicity when you treat with Pembro and Adjuvant? Of course, that's the audience, and I remade everything. So how's the toxicity in you? I put a 7% you know, overall patient needing high-dose steroid, but how have you found it overall? You use pembrolizumab in the metastatic setting, Dr. Uh, certainly used pembrolizumab <coughs> in the Keynote 564 trial and also in many other settings where pembrolizumab is proved. Um, but, you know, I talk to patients about the toxicities of immunotherapies um, as, you know, we're activating the immune system where the immune system is active. So on the skin, rashes is very common, probably more than 7%, right? Um, GI tract, diarrhea, or colitis, very rarely, less than 5%, pneumonitis or hepatitis, and then the endocrine toxicities are certainly common, and um, the most at risk are thyroid um, and adrenal insufficiency, but we also have to keep in mind the pituitary and the pancreas. So when these things happen, it can be quite life-altering, and we have to place that in context of a year of treatment and, um, and think through the toxicities with the patient. Well, let me do a plug here just out of Dr. Chang is very modest. She has a podcast, actually, that deals with immune-related AEs. Just tell you this is not a walk in the park. It's a beautiful podcast. I listen to it from, you know, time to time because after steroids, I would tell you I struggle with what to do. You do different for immune-related hepatitis than a colitis, and I learned I had a couple of cases you know, not for adjuvant pembrolizumab, but mostly in metastatic disease uh, of patients having um, CNS toxicities. And we're not talking about um, pituitary insufficiency and other. And these also would, you know, learn from the podcast, IVIG and everything. Want to say anything about it? Oh, yes. thank you. No, that's a <laughs> thanks for calling out Checkmate Now, uh, Checkpoint Now, MD. Um, we actually, you know, we've just interviewed many <coughs> of our colleagues that are experts. Right now, each of specialties are um, having experts in, who deal with these toxicities, and so uh, we have a nice series, I think, of 19 po um, podcast um, episodes online and. Uh, they're accessible through Spotify and Apple if anyone's interested. Um, but um, I, I think it's helpful to get the experts' opinion on, you know, w we can manage sort of first-line steroids and then what to do next, escalate. And the hepatology experts will be different than the CNS experts, and they'll be different than the um, uh, pulmonary ones. So I think it's important to get everybody involved. Um, what do you think, Monty? How do you manage in L.A.? So I have to confess, I'm a listener too. I, <laughs> I love your podcast. I think it's really well done. I, I think you hit it on the nail on the head with all the sort of considerations around adjuvant pembrolizumab in this patient. I just, you know, maybe add to that too that, you know, I'd brace this patient for the fact that sometimes those adverse events may become uh, coming beyond the scope of therapy. So mm. beyond that one year, there may be lingering toxicities, toxicities that onset beyond that one year span. You know, with immunotherapy, you really do have to be prepared for everything. Okay. So the patient, after seeing the three of us, actually, second opinion, goes back to Dr. Staler and said, who should I pick? Um, and, oh, um, you know, Dr. Staler, they're, <laughs> they're all good. And the patient picks Dr. Paul because oh, his, I wasn't expecting you know, that. his sister lives <laughs> in, in, in California and um, picks up Dr. Paul. Uh, Monty start him on a year of adjuvant pembrolizumab after nine months Scans were done, patient has pulmonary nodule, has two liver metastases, asymptomatic biopsy, clear cell RCC. Calls back Dr. Taylor, Dr. Taylor said, well, I, you shouldn't have seen Dr. Paul, but it is too late. <laughs> and uh, he goes to Dr. Zhang and says, progression while on therapy. What would you do? What would you use? Right. I think this is a somewhat of a data-free zone, right? Uh, as many of our first-line metastatic trials were, have been done uh, without adjuvant uh, treatments, um, but it's within the treatment duration of the one year of um, pembrolizumab, so he's somewhat IO refractory. 
Uh, I would certainly consider one of our uh, VEGF IO um, uh, combinations as well as, you know, kind of altering the mechanisms that the patient's been exposed to, so broadening out um, what the patient's had uh, before. Okay, so, so what happened to the patient? The patient wanted to do systemic therapy, but he said, you know what, I'm going to go to see the, you know, the guy on the East Coast that is uptight, always in a, you know, tie, comes to me, and at that time I had a trial. The trial uh, name was CONTACT-3, which randomizes patient to cabozantinib versus cabozantinib plus atezolizumab, trying to see if we should continue uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor after progression of immune checkpoint inhibitor. Now, today, fast forward, this trial finished accrual. This trial led by Dr. Paul and um, myself. The patient um, uh, started the study, and the first snowstorm in Boston completely leaves, goes back to Dr. Paul. Tell me a bit about continuing I.O. after I.O. The patient transferred, cycle two, day one is with you. So I actually give uh, Tony a lot of credit here. So CONTACT-3 is a trial that we've actually been talking about and conceiving <coughs> of for many, many years. And really when it was designed, it wasn't intended to fix this problem of therapy post-adjuvant. Right, essentially, we foresaw this scenario where folks were getting Nevo Ipi up front, Daxipembro up front, and we saw a lot of folks, our colleagues in the community, actually continuing immunotherapy beyond that. So we thought, okay, we'll do a trial of CABO plus or minus a Tezo. Tony actually had the foresight to say, wait a minute, adjuvant immunotherapy is on the horizon. Let's try to incorporate those individuals who are getting adjuvant immunotherapy. This way we have a, a rational way to really sort of tease out the contribution for a secondary immunotherapy. So while we have contact three, it's finished accrual. I can't wait to sort of see the readout on that. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, uh, Dr. Zheng, do you want to tell us a bit about other similar trials that are accruing that this patient uh, could have been on? Um, um, at the nine-month mark or initially? Uh, you know, uh, no, after progression. Oh, after progression. Um, well, I mean, any of our um, uh, first-line metastatic trials that allow prior PD-1 exposure, um, we could consider. I think Dr. Powell has a whole slew um, lined up to t discuss with us now. Um, but, you know, I, I would certainly encourage um, uh, trials um, in this uh, space where we, we haven't really had a lot of patients um, who have had exposure to PD-1 ex um, treatments in the adjuvant setting. Absolutely. So we, the patient comes back to Boston on, on their private plane. We re-review the pathology. We did not review it first. And I don't know, the pathologist in Germany have missed the sarcomatoid features just because you sent me only one slide. So the patient actually had around 20% sarcomatoid feature. There is data with nivolumab, epilumumab that blows my mind. Would you have given nivolumab, epilumumab, or you would have waited, or just the TKI, Dr. Paul? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. This is actually going to come up in real-world practice, so I do think we need to come up with some answers. You know, frankly, I use that adjuvant therapy period as a litmus test, and I would suggest that if that patient has really burned through adjuvant treatment while they're still on it at the nine-month mark, I'm just not 100% sure how much, you know, adding sort of the salvage approach with CTLA-4 is really going to help them. So I'd probably stick with a TKI in that second-line setting. I'm calling it second-line. It really is also potentially considered first-line. And, you know, I think that, again, trials like CONTACT-3, TNEVO-2, these are all things that really need to become considerations for patients like this. I, I agree fully. Maybe last question before moving uh, to Dr. Chang. This, let's say this patient... Um, recurred three years down the line. What is your cutoff on considering this patient, you know, for a first line like, like they never received, you know, immunotherapy? We know in bladder cancer we do it all the time and we go back and forth between six and 12 months. What do you think, data-free zone, your cutoff would be? Uh, well, we've written into our first-line metastatic trial, Tony, um, that, uh, you know, 12 months generally uh, is a as a good amount of time for uh, patients to you know, be resensitized, right, um, if you will, um, off of uh, prior IO exposure um, to T cell activation again. So I, I think if they've recurred a year or later, um, I would, um, you know, really try to think about all of our first-line metastatic options um, and immunotherapy-based uh, completely.
Well, you know, I guess we're going to move to the second section. I think this, this show that I just came up with, um, you know, uh, worked well. So uh, what about first-line therapies? I give it to you, and I hope this talk going to be a- as cool as your outfit. Oh, man, you're giving me way too much credit, Tony. It's very, very nice of you. I have to tell you, I'm always intimidated when I have to present frontline therapy with this group here because they've actually done a lot of the, the groundwork that, you know, set the, set the tone for frontline treatment. Um, so this is a really nice landscape slide. And I, I think that many of you in the audience have probably seen different versions of this. I'm just going to put this up here for you to stare at for a second. But, you know, I think many have made the point that when you look at frontline therapy for renal cell carcinoma, there's more similarities perhaps than differences. Having said that, you know, I think when it comes to the reality of what we do from day to day, then we're pressed to really make a decision, right? So we can't just say, hey, everything looks great. Let's go with, you know, one, uh, one of these regimens at random. So I'll try to walk you through some of the logic of how I pick frontline therapy and what I select in this setting. We're going to start by talking about the trials that look at TKI plus IO versus sunitinib. And this schematic, I don't think it oversimplifies things. This really is pretty representative. We have three separate trials looking at axipembro, cabonevo, and lenvatinib pembrolizumab. And they offer a juxtaposition against therapy with sunitinib, this conventional dose that we've gotten used to over the years. Um, I'm going to start by discussing the data from Keynote 426. So this is a trial juxtaposing axitinib and pembrolizumab against sunitinib. This is uh, notable in the sense that amongst all the trials of TKI plus IO, we have the longest follow-up from this one. You know, in terms of the difference in overall survival here, uh, there was this mic drop moment when the data was initially presented. If I recall correctly, the hazard ratio for overall survival back when the data was presented at ASCO GU several years ago, was actually 0.53. What's interesting about this data set, and this is maybe being a little bit nitpicky, but perhaps that OS hazard ratio has gradually increased over time. So you see now the hazard ratio reflected on the left of 0.73. In terms of the difference in progression-free survival, good. I would say modest, a difference of about four months in median PFS between the two groups. Um, response rate certainly higher with axitinib and pembrolizumab versus sunitinib, 60% versus 40%. The CR rate, 10% versus 3.5%. Um, you're going to see some updates here at ASCO 2022 pertaining to progression-free survival 2. So I encourage you to review some of these posters and poster discussions that we'll be citing throughout the course of this talk. Now, this is a trial that Tony led, in fact, um, that I do uh, lean on heavily in the clinic. This is the Checkmate 9ER study looking at cabozantinib with nivolumab. Um, You may recall that initially when uh, Tony presented data related to cabozantinib in renal cell carcinoma in the context of a small phase one trial, we shifted it first into the second line setting looking at cabozantinib versus everolimus in the context of Meteor, and that was at a dose of 60 milligrams. I thought it was a pretty gutsy move, but when Tony and colleagues were coming up with the design of this study, they actually used a dose of cabozantinib at 40 milligrams, so they took it down a notch. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind as you're considering frontline regimens and as you're dosing with this particular regimen. And what you see here, I thought, was a fairly significant difference in uh, magnitude uh, in terms of progression-free survival. There's a near doubling from eight months with sunitinib to 16 months with a combination of cabozantinib and nivolumab. As well, we see a difference in hazard ratio that's consistent with the other studies in this space, that overall survival hazard ratio is held over time at around 0.7. This was a really nice presentation that Tony and colleagues uh, uh, really developed at this meeting. It was presented by Christina Suarez. Um, And I thought it was really interesting. The concept behind this, as Christina explained it, was really to take responses and partition them, not just into a PR, right, but to take your partial responses and actually categorize them. We all know that PRs are uh, manifesting as a response greater than 30% or more than 30% reduction in tumor burden. What she's done is she's characterized it into three separate groups, 30 to 60%, 60 to 80%, and 80 to 100%. Um, And it might have seemed intuitive. For sunitinib, it doesn't necessarily hold. The numbers actually jump around a little bit. So you don't necessarily see that there is a higher rate of uh, PR1 versus PR2 and so on in terms of 12-month BFS. On the other hand, if you look at this depth of response metric that Christine has created, it actually looks as though there's more of a trend line. And this is articulated really nicely in her presentation as you go from CR to PR1 to PR2 and so on. 12-month PFS, overall survival really hold. 
And, and the gist of this, if I can kind of get to the bottom line, is that we make these big distinctions as we discuss with our patients the rates of complete response versus partial response versus stable disease. But in truth, a PR1, which implies here, as you see on this slide, that that depth of response is between 80 and 100 percent, probably doesn't behave that differently clinically from a complete response. And as I understood it, Tony, I think that was the general thesis of the presentation. Especially for overall survival. Especially for us, yeah, absolutely. So, so some useful data there, and I thought that was quite interesting. This is data from the CLEAR trial looking at lindatinib plus pembrolizumab versus snitinib. I'll note here that we are neglecting a, a third arm in this study, which is lindatinib and everolimus. Needless to say, that arm didn't really pan out when it came to overall survival advantage. Um, but what we see here is what I think is a fairly dramatic difference in OS, nine months with snitinib versus 23 uh, months with lindatinib and pembrolizumab. That's, that's PFS, excuse me. The difference in overall survival, however, despite having that huge sort of magnitude of benefit in PFS didn't look to be awfully different, and I was sort of struck by that. I would have expected to see maybe those OS curves se separate a little bit more. I don't know how to explain that. The median OS hazard ratio, not far from what we saw in Checkmate 90R or Keynote 426. You know, I, I have to tell you from personal experience, I think this is a tough regimen. You know, if you think about the principle with cabozantinib in Checkmate 90R, we went down on dose. We went from 60 milligrams to 40 milligrams there. In the context of the CLEAR trial, we actually took that dose of lenvatinib that we were familiar familiar with in the second line setting, 18 milligrams in combination with everolimus, we actually went up to 20. And I think that poses a challenge in terms of our day-to-day our -day practice. Um, I encourage you to all check out Martin Voss's poster, which is going to uh, outline the benefit of this regimen in the context of subsequent therapies. Now, ultimately, you know, we've had a lot of dialogues in person, on social media, et cetera, on how to make distinctions amongst these various regimens. You know, what it all boils down to me is I'm not seeing a marked benefit in PFS with axitinib and pembrolizumab, although that first overall survival hazard ratio might have been astounding. It's really equilibrated with the other trials. So I'm not using much axipembro in the frontline setting. When it comes to CLEAR, or the uh, trial of lenvatinib and pembrolizumab versus Checkmate 90R with Cabonevo, you know, some might say, well, gosh, look at that magnitude benefit in PFS and CLEAR. My, my personal perspective, though, is that, you know, it probably is balanced out by the toxicity profile that we're seeing. And that really bears out in the plots that I'm showing you here. And I'm, I've sort of simplified it down. I've cherry-picked a little bit amongst these uh, figures that I'm showing you here. But the quality of life data in the context of CLEAR is what I'd anticipated. We're not seeing a major difference or improvement in quality of life with Len Pembro, and I think a lot of that probably has to do with the dosing strategy. And Checkmate 90R, on the other hand, consistently you see that patients fare better in terms of quality of life with Cabonevo versus Sinitinib. So that really sort of tips the balance towards Cabonevo as being my preferred frontline regimen for the majority of patients. Um, we're going to digress for a second and talk a little bit about toxicity management. We focused a lot on efficacy, uh, and this has become something that I think the three of us have become very, very used to in our clinical practice. You know, no longer do we really have to, you know, sort of work hard to tease out what's driving toxicities in these patients. I think we've all become familiar with the premise that when you're using a TKI with an IO, and if you encounter a toxicity that may be considered overlapping, and you see some of those here in the Venn diagram, diarrhea and hepatitis are the two ones that plague me probably the most in clinical practice. What you do is you stop the TKI, you wait out a couple of half-lives. If the toxicity doesn't reduce, or if it's not uh, ameliorated over time, then you can blame it on the immunotherapy component. On the other hand, you know, if you stop that TKI, and within a couple of half-lives the toxicity dissipates, you, you know what to point the finger at by and large. So we've talked about TKI plus IO. We're going to shift gears and talk about another important trial in this space, and that's the Checkmate 214 study. This looked at nivolumab and nipilimumab. And I mentioned to you that Axipembro has the longest follow-up amongst the TKI IO studies. In point of fact, this study has the longest follow-up out of any of those. Um, and we're going to look at some of the five-year data for this trial that looks at nevo ipi versus sinitinib. So, you know, I, I've always held, and I, I'm going to stick to my guns today, that nevo ipi is something that should be confined to something, uh, patients that have intermediate and poor risk. I think it's so critical that you go back to the criteria that Tony and Danny Hang devised so many years ago, the IMDC criteria, and really plug it into your calculator so you know the risk status of your patient. If a patient's intermediate or poor risk, I think this plot says it all, you do have a significant benefit in terms of overall survival. If you're in the favorable risk category, it's a little bit more of a gray area. 
I'm not going to get into the minutia of a lot of these slides, but I think this slide that looks at PFS really articulates the same point. Again, if you're intermediate and poor risk, you see a nice tail on the curve amongst patients receiving nevo -ipi. On the other hand, in favorable risk with respect to PFS, it almost seems as though those patients getting TKI tend to fare better. You can look at this in a number of different ways. I would say supporters of use of nevo -ipi for favorable risk patients might call upon data like this, where you see a 13% CR rate with nevo -ipi versus 6% with sinitinib. These numbers are very small. I think it's tough. It really feels like you're splitting hairs there. So I tend to look at the plots that I showed you previously to arbitrate this decision. When it comes to long-term survival, again, you can try to make some arguments in the favorable risk category that's displayed on the right, but I would still hold that in broad terms, and if we take this trial at face value for what it was intended to demonstrate, the benefit is certainly more substantial in the patients with intermediate and poor risk disease, and I think that's a fair argument. This is the incidence of treatment-related adverse events over time. I think this is really meant to really demonstrate that as patients gain experience on nevo ipi, the incidence and frequency of adverse events tapers off as time goes on. You can see very few adverse events emerging as you get out to three and four years, no doubt. And, and certainly this is an argument in favor of nevo ipi. I certainly think there's a, a place for it in the kidney cancer clinic. You can see here that patients getting nevo ipi seem to be faring better over time as it pertains to quality of life. There's a really elegant presentation from uh, David Cella and Bob Mozer uh, today that articulated health-related quality of life, looking at it from a longitudinal perspective. I thought that was quite unique, um, as opposed to just looking at baseline characteristics or looking at little snapshots at various points in time. Of course, I think one of the principal benefits of nevo -ipi is this potential for it to offer treatment-free intervals. And this is something that Dave McDermott, Mer Meredith Reagan, and others have really taught us a lot about. You know, we all have those patients in our practice that have been challenged with nevo -ipi who come off therapy for a variety of reasons. In some cases, they've actually graduated to the two-year mark and are able to come off the treatment. <clears throat> and I would, I would propose that um, that's one of the, the, the benefits that extends it with this regimen. There's, there's the potential for extended holidays with it. Now, I would be remiss if I talked about nevo -ipi without talking about a study that was really led by the City of Hope family over here. We have the first author of the Nature Medicine paper that I'm going to talk about in just a moment, Nasli Dismond, co-first author Luis Meza here. The whole team really played an integral role in running this trial. My group has been really, really invested in studying the microbiome in cancer. And, and truthfully, you know, Nasli and I have been working on this for, gosh, almost seven or eight years now. So it's really nice to see some of this data come to fruition. There's been a lot of data, which we won't go into in, uh, uh, this evening, that really supports the fact that the composition of the gut microbiome may potentially influence outcomes with immunotherapy. And there is this really intriguing paper, not in kidney cancer, but in lung cancer. I'm showing the Kaplan-Meyen curves here in the bottom right that shows that with the agent CBM588, which is a live bacterial product essentially encompassing Clostridium butyricum, you can have patients who have better outcomes in the context of receiving checkpoint inhibitors. This is a retrospective data set in the context of non-small cell lung cancer. This is an agent that's actually commercially available in Japan, so it's used in a very widespread fashion over there. I was just so intrigued by this. And the mechanism that they purport is that perhaps Clostridium butyricum deposits into the lower gut releases butyrate, a short-chain fatty acid, and really stimulates this Im uh, immune-permissive environment around the tumor. So uh, Nasli and, um, and uh, Luis and others led this trial looking at nevo ipi with CBM versus nevo ipi alone. Um, we actually have a follow-up to the study with Cabo Nevo plus or minus CBM588 that Luis is running. He's presenting it in the trials in progress session. Luis and Jasnur, an undergrad, in fact, actually got a $700,000 grant to fund this trial. Very, very impressive. Um, uh, but in any case, what they demonstrated in this initial study, and I'm going to focus your attention on the bottom, is that when you add CBM588 to Nevo Ipi, man, there seems to be a tremendous magnitude of benefit in terms of progression-free survival, a trend towards benefit in overall survival. So we're really, really excited to see how this whole um, area is going to move forward, and, and it's certainly an area of active investigation within our group. I think what really probably holds more tangible, you know, promise, the studies that we're doing are very preliminary, are some of these studies that Tony and Tian are leading. The first is a trial that they're both um, are running through the Alliance Cooperative Group called Pedigree. Really, really novel study, and I'll, I'll certainly let Tian expand on that later. Um, there's trials looking at combinations of belzutifan, lenvatinib, and pembrolizumab within the upfront setting. Uh, Tony's running Cosmic 313, a trial looking at the triplet of Cabo, Nevo, and Ipi. 
Um, so lots and lots of excitement in this space. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Tony. Oh, great. Monty, never disappoint. So let, let's, let's get a real case. And I have actually a lot of questions. Thank you for sending, um, you know, uh, questions here. So um, this patient, uh, Julia, is a 65-year-old uh, woman that presents with um, abdominal pain, elevated blood pressure, a slight cough, um, got ruled out for COVID. Abdominal CT uh, shows a large renal mass, and she has undergone a left radical nephrectomy by the same surgeon, you know where he lives. And um, a six centimeter uh, mass was taken, renal cell cancer, recovered uh, very well uh, post-op, clear cell RCC. 24 months later, imaging shows two enlarging lung nodule. Biopsy, an FNA was positive for renal cell cancer. Overall, we all did the IMDC risk score and the patient had zero uh, risk factor. So that's between 20, 25% of all patients. So favorable risk overall. So I'm going to start by you, Dr. Trang. What would you have done? What's your treatment of choice? IOTKI, dual IO, clinical, well, I'm taking scribal clinical trial. IOTKI, IO, IO, IO single agent, or TKI, NY. Right. Um, so in favorable risk disease, I think this is a, a space where we have the longest conversations with our patients because it really depends on patients' goals and what they want to get out of treatment. Um, I, I say, you know, the good thing is we have a, you know, a long prognosis, <coughs> but, you know, any of these uh, regimens are technically approved and on label, right? So if they're shooting for a complete response, Monty showed a nice 13% um, complete response on Ipinevo. Um, that's what we can go first. Um, if they're shooting for, you know, the best uh, rate of disease control, and I want these things to shrink, and I want the most probability of getting things to shrink, well, I, I think a TKI and IO um, are, are very reasonable. And, and any of the three combinations, Axi, Pembro, uh, Len, Pembro, or uh, Cabonevo are all options. And, um, and, you know, there are patients who are not immunotherapy candidates, right? So they either have underlying autoimmune disorders or they um, have some other, uh, you know, GI colitis issues um, where they may not tolerate IO treatments. And so, uh, you know, we can talk about a TKI treatment because I do think these are more angiogenically driven um, than, than others. So um, I, I think any of these options are completely um, on the table and we have a long conversation with the patient to figure out which is the right one. Absolutely, totally agree. Now this is 12, 24 months later. The patient, two lung nodules um, in the right lower lobe. Would you consider a lobectomy or maybe SRS, Dr. Paul? Yeah, absolutely. It's something that we're becoming more and more familiar with. One of my fellows, Zainab Zengen, is putting together a beautiful manuscript, actually, that looks at SBRT in this context, benefit before and after and what have you. And she's got some nice genomics work to accompany that. But certainly, I think that would be on my radar. Local therapy, if you can do it, it's uh, something to consider. Well, let's say this patient presents. We have a lot of questions about cytoreductive nephrectomy, rightly so. Patient present with uh, metastatic disease. These nodules, you know, add another one, a third one that is nine millimeter in the other lung, and, and a shadiness, you know, a bit of shady spot on the liver. We don't know what it is, but the question here, of course, the surgeon will always, you know, be able technically to remove that kidney. But would you do a cytoreductive nephrectomy or start? Let's say you don't have the probe trial. Would you do cytoreductive nephrectomy or start by systemic therapy? Three small lesions in the lung, maybe something in the liver, maybe not. Uh, I, I think it's on the table as an option, um, but I think in the <coughs> era now of very active systemic agents, um, you know, we can um, pose it as an option to think about systemic therapy first and then say we the lung nodules respond, but in the primary, I always tell people with de novo metastatic disease, <coughs> the primary will not shrink to zero, right? And so it will still have some mass, um, even if it has a little bit of response. So um, for those patients, um, if the lung nodules melt away and you know, the primary shrinks a little bit, maybe it's an easier surgery um, to post to our urologist. Yeah, I have to say in my practice, which hasn't changed after Carmina, I would send this patient surgery. I take into consideration 
not just patient performance status, but the disease burden more than anything else. And I think sometimes Carmina heard that's the trial of cytoreductive nephrectomy with, uh, you know, sunetinib, where the cytoreductive nephrectomy actually was the uh, experimental uh, arm. The problem with that study is that what we're seeing it's sometimes either underinterpreted or overinterpreted. What we see in practice, sometimes we're missing on taking uh, the kidney out where 90% or more of the disease uh, is. And Monty, this has been your practice. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Disease burden is so key. I mean, if you flip the scenario, and if it's a patient with, you know, innumerable pulmonary metastases, liver mets, bone mets, et cetera, I personally see very little value inside of a nephrectomy there. There I sort of feel the priority is getting that patient onto systemic therapy. And if this patient had papillary kidney cancer, uh, would you favor, let's say, more a surgery here, more cytoreductive nephrectomy? Because that is perhaps less effective systemic therapies? Yeah, precisely. I, mean, I think in that scenario that you described, if there's just a small num number of pulmonary mets, if it's papillary histology, knowing that systemic therapy isn't quite as effective there, I'd definitely try to get that primary out, and maybe even offer local therapy to the lung mets. But I agree. Multidisciplinary approach, certainly, you know, a discussion with the surgeons about timing and operability is all within the realm of what we should do. So the patient actually uh, decides to have one more scan after six weeks, you know, had a lot of uh, social commitments, and the scans, the new scans, six, eight weeks later, showed two new pulmonary nodules, and that's, you know, shady spot on the liver is actually a metastasis. We got an MRI, and we got a biopsy, and then actually two of them showed one under the capsule, another one. So the patient actually was uh, started on uh, cabozentinib and nivolumab, and after three months achieved a partial response. Didn't like the side effects and didn't like to come a lot of, to the hospital. So, Dr. Chang, the question for you, when do you consider stopping systemic therapy? And would you stop both agents, one agent? The patient has a deep response after, has around 60% too much shrinkage after three months. Right. I mean, with the, in the context of the data that was presented today uh, by Dr. Suarez on the ASCO stage, you know, I would <coughs> consider very good prognosis for that patient, right, and with that depth of response. And um, if they were having um, toxicity issues and adverse events that are limiting, I, I think it's reasonable um, to take a break. Dr. Paul? Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I, I would certainly want to talk them through the strategy of dose reduction and so forth, <laughs> see if they might be willing to tolerate that. I, I do think that breaks are permissible in some contexts. It's a, it's a little tougher with VEGF plus IO because, you know, I certainly do see some rebounds sometimes if I pull off the TKI entirely, you know, but uh, I think dose reduction, uh, detailed discussion around that would be my first approach. And have you started, we know that, uh, you know, the FDA indicated uh, dosage, let's say, with combination um, therapies with Len Pembro, uh, Limvatinib is at 20, with Axi, Pembro, Axi is 5 PID, and with Cabo actually is the only drug at 40, which is less than the monotherapy. But in general, in your approach, there particular patient where you start lower anyhow, let's say Cabo 20 or Len uh, 18, or not really, you prefer to start full dose, the FDA approved dose, and then go down. You know, I've got to tell you, I've heard of a lot of my colleagues uh, in my area, you know, prescribing linvat and pembrolizumab with a lower starting dose, and I've reached out to them and sort of advised against that. You know, if the fear is <coughs> toxicity, right, and if you drop the dose down to 14, 10 milligrams, 8 milligrams, I've seen that in some cases as a starting dose, you know, there's a dose response with these drugs, and I'm not sure you're really sort of extracting the PFS and OS benefit that you're looking for if you're starting at those lower doses. Well, I know you ran a study, I mean, it was post-TKI, of two doses of lymphatinib yeah. plus everolimus, but you're not going to speak about that. Dr. Chang is going to tell us about, and what did teach us, because I have to tell you, I was a bit confused about the results. Yeah, yeah. You know, so uh, well, my, that's what happened. You know, my takeaway, and Monty can tell us more, <laughs> uh, that from your trial, Monty, was that, you know, the two are pretty comparable. And um, uh, to be honest, my own practice says um, I don't hesitate to dose reduce quickly uh, if <laughs> patients are not tolerating early. Um, and I do think that 
um, giving more doses over time is better than high dose and then off, um, you know, for a, a really severe or life-threatening toxicity. So um, giving a lower dose over a longer period of time, in, in my mind, it gets patients on treatment for longer. I have to say the practice has been all over the place, even when those patients older that you know, I know wouldn't do well on uh, TKIs. Uh, I, I found it hard to those uh, escalate because I always think they do have some sort of uh, side effects. What's the dose, you know, escalation? I would, instead of waiting for a month, I would wait for the scans because what if they have a response? We know toxicity correlate with activity in general, but it's a correlation. It's not a 100% correlation. We have those patients that are tolerating drug perfectly well and have a response. So I struggled into that and I pushed the dose escalation till the scan time, and I should not have done that. I, I don't know if you do that from time to time. Well, I have to tell you, that's one of the challenges that we ran into in that Len Ev dose finding study that, mm -hmm. that TM's gonna go over shortly. Um, but we actually allowed for patients to go from 14 milligrams to 18 milligrams. We found that in practice, it was very challenging to have practitioners do that consistently. There was a very low tendency to actually ultimately escalate dose. Okay, you know, we're, we're we're over time, and I think Dr. Jang is going to tell us a bit about refractory disease. This is the patient who, after you know, two years of cabozentinib and uh, uh, nivolumab, decided to come off because they had 90% deep response and a year later um, progressed. And uh, you know, they didn't want to be rechallenged with the same uh, therapy, and they wanted something else. So you're going to tell us what is else, and go ahead, the floor Fair is enough. yours. Um, you know, we have multiple um, trials now uh, have, that have read out in the refractory setting. Um, I'm showing you here um, the phase two trial of limvatinib and everlimus um, that reported out um, several years ago. Um, this is, um, uh, I think, um, Monty, your trial um, that, uh, that you spoke of um, in one of our virtual ASCOs. Um, and so you'll see here that the, the, um, the difference between 40 milligram starting dose and, um, versus 18 milligrams of starting dose lenvatinib uh, in the blue um, is not much difference, right? So uh, medium PFS, um, a three month difference, um, uh, and OS is uh, really, um, uh, I can't see much light between those curves. So uh, that's why, you know, my takeaway, I really think that these um, two dosing strategies are, are quite comparable from a clinical efficacy standpoint. Um, uh, how about TiVo3? So we, we do have a new therapy now um, that was approved in the last year, Tavosinib, um, for clear, uh, clear cell kidney cancer in the refractory setting, and it was based off of the phase three TiVo3 data. Uh, this is uh, the progression-free curve, uh, progression-free survival curve that we're showing you here on the left. Um, and you'll see that PFS was uh, statistically significant, I would argue um, uh, clinically significant as well, uh, between tavazinib and serafinib. Um, and thinking through um, the toxicities, um, we do see the um, VEGF TKI expected toxicities, hypertension, diarrhea, hand foot syndrome, fatigue, and rashes, um, although more rashes um, in the serafinib arm than the tavazinib arm. All right, um, so the, here are um, a bit more on TiVo3 safety um, data, um, just kind of thinking through all the TKI toxicities. I would um, think through that, um, you know, for tavazinib, we're really um, not as many, I would say, grade three, four events that we see um, as much as we do um, for serafinib. So um, when we're in the refractory setting, patients are a little bit more frail. Um, I do think of this as a more gentler uh, TKI option um, with some efficacy data and now approved therapy. Um, so tevazinib um, from uh, the phase three T uh, TiVo3 data um, uh, showed a clinically meaningful activity um, compared with serafinib in patients with uh, advanced refractory clear cell kidney cancer. Um, there were patients who had a prior um, checkpoint inhibitor um, and VEGF TKI, um, and um, those patients um, still had objective responses, 23% um, with tevazinib, 11% um, with serafinib. Um, and we did see a little bit more favorable toxicities, I would say, it's a little bit easier to tolerate um, than serafinib overall. And so this was um, approved um, within the past year uh, for patients with relapse or refractory advanced renal cell carcinoma. So what about a combination approach? Um, so we saw some data, early data, uh, phase one, two data of T-NEVO. 
um, uh, of combining tavazinib with nivolumab. And you'll see here um, patients that were separated out in cohorts of treatment naive, so first line versus previously treated in the, um, in the blue. Um, and so uh, you'll see that there are um, some uh, medium progression-free survival um, signals of, uh, of the combination, um, which we uh, would, I would say, is, um, expect in patients um, uh, who uh, are treated with a VEGF and uh, nivolumab combination. So that sets up very well the phase three um, TNEVO2 study that um, Monty alluded to earlier, um, that you see the schema of um, in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, uh, enrolling patients with um, metastatic kidney cancer, uh, one or two more prior lines of therapy, um, looking specifically also for patients who are refractory to IO therapies um, and randomizing those patients to either tavazinib with nivolumab or uh, tavazinib monotherapy. Um, so I think this is a really exciting trial and a trial that um, will define, uh, help us define in addition to CONTACT-03 the HIF pathway, and uh, now um, the incredible um, uh, bench-to-bedside story uh, that we've had with belzudafen. And so many of you are familiar with this data of belzudafen in kidney cancer as a monotherapy given at 120 milligrams daily. Um, this was a phase 1-2 study of belzudafen alone, um, which showed an objective response rate of 25% um, and uh, 14 uh, confirmed par um, uh, partial responses. The median progression-free survival in this um, cohort of patients uh, was 14.5 months. Um, and belzudafen uh, did show us um, a, a good efficacy, anti-tumor activity. Um, in addition, when we um, uh, combined it with cabozantinib, this is data that Dr. Shwari showed us um, about what, a year ago at this point, um, uh, of uh, the combination of belzudafen and cabozantinib. Can we add to the activity of cabozantinib in the refractory setting? Um, and so this was cohort two um, that had uh, prior immunotherapies as well as um, uh, likely um, prior VEGF inhibition, um, and we saw an objective response rate of 28.8%. Uh, but with 45 of those um, these 52 patients having some disease stability um, and no growth in my clinic is, is a good sign. Um, so uh, these patients um, generally had some uh, disease control. So um, I do think that is a promising signal, and it sets up very well um, these phase three trials on the right-hand side. You see two schemas here of ongoing trials in the refractory setting. Uh, the top one uh, shows you um, unresectable metastatic um, clear cell kidney cancer uh, previously treated, less than three prior uh, treatments, um, randomized to either belzudafen alone versus everolimus, really setting up belzudafen as a monotherapy, um, as a registrational trial, uh, randomizing uh, more than 700 patients. And then the bottom one, um, belzudafen with linvatinib uh, compared against cabozantinib, so another benchmark um, uh, comparison against cabozantinib um, with a uh, uh, number uh, needed to enroll over 700. So I think both of these trials are active, um, and they will define the landscape for um, uh, post-refractory uh, patients uh, treated with belzudafen and uh, the label for, for belzudafen in the future. I want to take a moment to think a little bit about MET inhibition and um, as a segue um, to talking about the CLIPSO trial that was um, uh, discussed um, today and presented at ASCO on the ASCO stage. Um, and so in thinking about MET inhibition, so MET uh, itself is a receptor for the hepatocyte growth factor. We know MET to be overexpressed in kidney cancer for patients with bone metastases and is a measure more of uh, mesenchymal um, uh, characteristics and more aggressive disease. And so as I'm thinking about MET inhibition um, and trying to think about um, cabozantinib, which we know uh, hits both MET as well as Axel and other VEGF targets, and then also savalitinib um, in terms of thinking through uh, today's Calypso trial, um, the differences of savalitinib versus cabozantinib is maybe a little bit um, on how they target MET. So um, savalitinib is a class one ATP competitive inhibitor, um, and it fits in the um, uh, binding pocket of ATP during the active um, position of, um, of CMET versus um, cabozantinib is actually a class two agent. And so this uh, cabozantinib can bind um, MET even in the inactive phase. 
Um, and so if you nerd out with me for a second on um, biochemistry here, I think this is a small difference, but maybe one that, uh, that has a, a difference. And, and also, um, in addition, the cabozantinib has more targets um, than just on MET inhibition. So trying to build on the uh, success of uh, cabozantinib from the METEOR trial, how do we combine cabozantinib with other agents in this refractory setting, and then will these other MET inhibitors have a similar effect in refractory clear cell RCC? So um, uh, setting up um, uh, both the, the combination uh, treatments with cabozantinib as well as the CLIPSO trial. Um, so uh, this was a, a COSMIC 021 trial um, that had a multiple um, uh, disease cohorts across um, GU cancers uh, that Monty led um, uh, a couple years ago, um, and the, the kidney cohorts were uh, presented, and, we'll, um, and we saw that atezolizumab in combination with cabozantinib had significant activity. Um, with an objective response rate here of 58% in clear cell kidney cancer and 31% in non-clear cell kidney cancer. So we do know that um, uh, cabozantinib with atezolizumab has um, good activity and good um, uh, response rates um, for both clear cell and non-clear cell disease. So this sets up the CONTACT-03 trial uh, that Tony t um, discussed a little bit earlier um, and that is in, uh, has a finished accruals for metastatic kidney cancer that has um, uh, had prior immunotherapy checkpoint in, uh, treatments um, and uh, patients are randomized to either atezolizumab with cabozantinib or cabozantinib alone. So can we enhance and is uh, cabozantinib enough of uh, immunomodulatory behavior to um, improve and salvage uh, these responses in the refractory setting. So again, a very important trial. Uh, it has fully accru uh, accrued, and we're looking forward um, to seeing uh, the results of CONTACT-03. Um, this sets up then uh, the phase two Calypso trial. Um, but so the, this were patients treated uh, with clear cell kidney cancer that um, had received previous uh, VEGF targeted therapy. Um, they were treated in uh, one of four cohorts, um, and the initial cohort that was the control cohort was savalitinib. Um, after enrolling 19 patients in this refractory setting, the standard of care changed to become nivolumab based on checkpoint, uh, Checkmate 025, and therefore um, the standard here has changed over to Dervalumab. Um, enrolling 39 patients on that cohort. And then there were two um, experimental cohorts, Dervalimab with Tremolimumab, adding in CTLA-4 inhibition, and um, Dervalimab with Savalitinib, uh, which is the MET uh, inhibitor that I discussed earlier. And you see the complete responses and the partial responses are modest. Um, they are, uh, I think Tom put it well when he said, not spectacular on the ASCO stage, and uh, they are. So they're um, certainly not the rates that we we would expect even of single agent um, PD-1 inhibitors, 11% um, uh, objective responses for trivalumab alone um, does not quite match up to what we saw with nivolumab, which was 25%. Um, and of note, uh, with trivalumab and savalitinib, around 13% objective responses. And then thinking about um, the MET status, so if savalitinib was hedged on uh, uh, inhibiting MET and if MET is the true um, active driver of disease in metastatic disease, is this um, the, the right target and, uh, and is, uh, is savalitinib enough? And what we saw from the Calypso trial um, they did a, a really great job in terms of thinking through the correlatives of MET-driven disease versus non-MET-driven disease. And what they saw was that savalitinib-containing regimens really didn't make much of a difference in either one. Um, perhaps there was some um, uh, prognostic factor of MET, um, but uh, overall um, the, the treatment itself did not make a difference for either uh, MET-driven uh, refractory kidney cancer or non-MET-driven disease. So some takeaways in refractory um, kidney cancer. I think uh, tavazinib, uh, we've seen uh, the clinical effect and now is now approved in the United States um, and uh, is currently combined with nivolumab in ongoing trials. We have belzutifen now approved for uh, von Hippel-Lindau syndrome and multiple ongoing trials um, compared against Everlimus and also in combination uh, with uh, lymvatinib. 
Um, not all MET inhibitors are the same. So um, if we've no and learned something from today's Calypso trial, I think uh, cabozantinib has significant activity um, and also in adding to uh, our immunotherapies in the refractory context. I'm looking forward to the contact 03 trial reading out. And then savalitinib um, does not seem to have the same effect, even in MET-driven clear cell kidney cancer. And why is this? Well, I think probably we can hedge our bets that uh, cabozantinib has other VEGF targets, the axle target, um, that uh, is really quite more uh, broader in its um, approach uh, to inhibiting uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, uh, tyrosine kinase receptors than uh, savalitinib, which is purely uh, met all right, with that, I will turn it over to you, uh, Tony, to take us through the last case. Okay, great. So the last case here, so this is a 65-year-old patient that presents with nausea, fat nausea, fatigue, and uh, weight loss, and abdominal CT shows a 6-centimeter uh, left renal mass, and the patient, let's say, starts on uh, uh, systemic uh, therapy here. And, um, you know, I, I want to... Just digress a bit, just simply because the off script, I got many questions um, here to um, fit our audience. So let's say this patient has clear cell renal cell carcinoma, and you want to design a study. Today in the refractory setting, would you design a study directly after progression on VEGF and IO? What are the targets? for a study in the refractory setting, Dr. Chang, that the patient need to have the tumor progressed on? Is it only VEGF and PD-1? And what do you think the number of prior lines would be? Just for the general audience, when we talk about trials together. Sure. Uh, you know, I, um, in the refractory setting, um, I don't love to limit lines of treatment because I think patients who are fit for any trial um, and performance status and they can handle the, some of the toxicities, they should be offered a trial. Um, so I don't love limiting numbers of lines of treatment, but many of these trials do, and many of them limit probably around three lines. Um, I would certainly allow prior VEGF IO combinations, prior VEGF alone, prior IO alone, um, and or prior IO IO combinations, all of which are standard in the frontline setting. And Dr. Paul, what would you do? Yeah, I, I completely agree with Tian. I mean, it's it's nice to have trials that are permissive in terms of eligibility. You know, I will say that if you have a patient treated, for instance, with Cabonevo up front, like the scenario that you proposed earlier. There's no real, you know, de facto second line standard, is there? So, you know, I think that that's an area that's ripe for study. In fact, you know, <coughs> as we discuss cases at City of Hope, oftentimes if I have really intriguing phase one trials that make sense, cellular therapies, <coughs> bite, et cetera, I'm oftentimes considering those patients in the second line setting. Tell us about a bit cellular therapy. So we talked about HIF2 inhibitor. I'm not going to bring it again, promising target, but you know, CAR T's and other, what's, what's the target there a bit about immunocellular therapy? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we actually have two trials uh, that are enrolling at, you know, City of Hope, some are running at multiple, uh, both running at multiple centers around the country, frankly, uh, and both actually exploit a target uh, known as CD70. So CD70 is a very pervasive target in clear cell kidney cancer. It also seems to be highly abundant in cutaneous T cell lymphomas. So one of our trials, uh, which uses a CRISPR-modified allogeneic T cell, uh, is being run both in the context of clear cell RCC and CTCL. Um, we have a, a second study using a very similar premise, but using a slightly different conditioning regimen using uh, a CD52 monoclonal antibody. Excellent. Dr. Deng, you know, we look at, at all, and one of the lucky things we had right, for our patients, that we had three TCGAs, the Cancer Genome Atlas, in kidney cancer, chromophore, papillary, and, of course, clear cell RCC. And if you look all of them and you look at the tumor microenvironment, it's just unbelievable shifting in, in, in the tumor metabolism and all these metabolic pathways that are dysregulated. So there was a lot of hope on um, uh, a glutamate inhibitor here, glutaminase inhibitor, uh, with the start. So, do, but the study was 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 negative. Do you want to describe describe yeah, it a bit? Sure. What uh, you know, I had myself. I had patients on the Cantata trial uh, with telegalinostat in combination with cabozantinib <coughs> versus cabozantinib alone. 
And what I would say what we learned from Cantata is that cabozantinib alone is a really high uh, uh, you know, curb to meet and, um, and that it sets a, a really high threshold, right, um, to try to beat. So um, it was, uh, as uh, Dr. Tanir presented, um, a negative study. Um, and uh, we, you know, unfortunately, we didn't see the meta metabolomics and the dependence on glutaminase pan out, right, um, in terms of clinical efficacy. Um, but, you know, I, I, I would hope to maybe we can improve on it, and maybe there's other ways to uh, alter the uh, meta uh, metabolic uh, pathways. Perfect. So, you know, the patient uh, experienced, let's say, uh, progression here, and um, there wasn't much clinical trials at that time, and the decision was made to put the patient on uh, tivazinib. So we've seen you presented the data with tivazinib, and, and I wonder, um, Dr. Paul here, what's your experience working with tivazinib in the third-line setting? What's the tolerance, and how can you help manage patient on this therapy? Yeah, yeah, so we were one of the highest occurs on TiVo3, the study that uh, Tien so <coughs> eloquently outlined. Um, and, and I have to tell you, there's something different about the agent. I think it's fairly well tolerated. I think the appropriate place for it is in the sequences you described after cabozantinib-based therapy and so forth. But, you know, what I would propose is that it seems to be distinct from other agents in our armamentarium. It, it has very uh, substantial specificity for VEGF receptors, so some have likened it to axitinib. Um, but actually, uh, Luis Meza is putting together some data that shows that really the agent bears activity even after axitinib. So there seems to be something, some special sauce there with it. And so I think in the third, fourth line setting where it's approved, it's a very reasonable choice. Yeah, I mean, we know very well that there is a study uh, post uh, uh, IO, post PD1, PDL1 inhibitor, the TNEVO study, which is randomizing patient to tivazanib versus tivazanib plus nivolumab, asking again, like contact three, if we should continue immune checkpoint inhibitor, specifically with PD1 or PDL1 inhibitor after progression on prior PD1, PDL1 inhibitor. The study just opened. So the, the good thing here, it will have. I would say uh, not so uh, minimal uh, amount of patient with uh, prior uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor with pembrolizumab adjuvant, which I think perhaps is a different biology altogether than progressing than progression on metastatic disease. I don't know that for sure, but uh, perhaps uh, that is that is the case. So uh, w one question I had, which really we did not uh, dig into this. This is mostly around a clear cell RCC, but um, the non-clear cell RCC. So um, one question, what the third most common is, is chromophobe RCC. Dr. Jank, uh, how would you approach a metastatic, let's say this patient first line metastatic, a chromophobe renal cell cancer? I keep hearing systemic therapies don't work very well. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it's a hard <laughs> um, disease to tackle and, um, uh, you know, I've only had a few in my career, and they were all um, challenging and difficult cases to uh, manage and um, and go through and walk that journey with the patients. Now, I, I certainly think that any of our combinations um, now are that are approved for all advanced renal cell carcinoma are um, fine strategies. Um, and you know, I, I think I've seen some um, efficacy with cabozantinib containing regimens. Um, and you know, I would. Um, try to point them to those, um, and I would also try to find trials um, that are specifically designed for chromophobe biology. Well, Dr. Paul, that has been a very small subset um, of patients that had maybe nine patient chromophobe uh, with Len Everolimus. Are you using that in your practice? Yeah, you know, I was, uh, same paper came to mind from Tom Hudson in European Neurology, you know, looking at, uh, uh, at various histologies, including from the whole with Len Ev. And that's the one setting where I might actually potentially push Len Ev forward. Out of those nine patients, if I recall correctly, four patients had responses for response rate of 44%. Very, very small numbers. Definitely requires further study. But I, I might actually consider using that earlier on. I will say that it's, it's been a little disheartening to see some of the data coming out of 
for instance, our trial of Cabo Atizo or, for instance, Cabo Nevo, there it doesn't seem like the chromophobe patients are responding very well. seems Absolutely. like the response is somewhat blunted in that population. We, we do have with Dr. McGregor a study of cabozantinib, nivolumab, and epilimumab okay. triplet. We're putting patient on knowing though, you know, we have uh, one of my postdocs, Dr. Chris Labaki, has a poster uh, looking at several chromophobe, couple of chromophobe RC single cell sequencing to er interrogate the tumor microenvironment. And these are really cold tumor. That checkpoint expression is lower. These are really, really cold tumors. So perhaps I think, and we work very closely with Dr. Um, uh, Hansky here, you know, Dr. Hansky, who's really been, been um, uh, a lot helped by the KC Cure, who addresses a lot of these rare uh, histologies here. We're working with her perhaps at some point on a, on a tumor vaccine where you can get these T cells because the t inside actually the tumor, but it's very challenging and a lot of us in the academic setting, I, 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 we see these patients. Absence of that, almost throwing the kitchen sink of it, it's not the smartest thing to do, but I haven't seen many responses except perhaps with Len Everolimus or an Everolimus or a TOR approach uh, you know, yeah, I have a couple of responses um, on bevacizumab, everolimus. Sure. And in, in the um, Aspen trial, for example, right, there was a cohort of right. chromophobe uh, patients, uh, patients with chromophobe um, kidney cancer, and they were um, of the forest plot, and with all the caveats of forest plots, um, they were more benefiting from everolimus rather than sunitinib. So I do think, you know, maybe less VEGF-driven, um, you know, and the mTOR inhibition has a role. So one question we, we didn't touch on a lot of uh, molecular uh, biology and asking you here, are you, are you getting routine uh, genomic testing and what on these patients, even the adjuvant uh, patient or the localized patient or you wait till metastatic disease? And in and, and practice, Dr. Paul, how, how successful you've been? Yeah, and yeah. finding a target. You publish a lot. You work with Foundation, Gardent, and others. How, how successful has this approach been? So, you know, it's interesting. So you brought up that scenario, for instance, of the patient who received Cabo Nevo in the frontline setting. Um, and when it comes to second-line therapy, the clinical decision that I'm making, and this is, you know, a little bit off the record, is between linvatinib and everolimus in most of my patients, or I'm actually considering sliding tavazinib up a little earlier. If the patient's frail, if they have substantial comorbidities, I'm actually using some tavazinib second line these days. Um, and what I would suggest is that the genomic profiling comes in handy because if they really seem to have a TOR pathway-driven tumor, if they have mutations in uh, you know, mTOR itself or what are downstream mediators, then, then I probably lean more towards using LEN-EV in that context. Um, it might be a, a useful decision point. You know, I, I personally think that it's a little too soon to get uh, uh, NGS if you're in the adjuvant setting, but I do think in advanced disease there's a potential for it to be actionable. I think it's really key for non-clear cell histologies, and there we found what you might call a couple of needle in a haystacks, but very worthwhile ones in the sense that we came across, for instance, a cohort of papillary patients who had ALK fusions, mm -hmm. and we actually ended up treating those patients with electinib, and they fared far better with that approach than they did with conventional RCC-based therapy. So I thought that was quite interesting. So for non-clear cell disease, I really think there's good rationale to do it. Well, moving from uh, germline uh, testing to, uh, for, from genomic testing to germline testing, so, um, you know, I remember how five, ten years ago it was an almost no-no. They had to meet criteria. We were afraid of some insurance problems, labeling patient, what to do. But since that time, it has become so accessible, you know. Um, so who do you reserve germline testing to? Is there a cutoff for age, for family history, for histology, Dr. Chang? Um, you know, I will <laughs> suggest it, and if patients are in um, the, their 40s or younger um, and developing kidney cancer, certainly if they have first-degree relatives um, that have had um, uh, kidney cancer or urothelial um, upper tract disease as associated with Lynch syndrome, for example, and so um, I will suggest it. And um, if uh, and we are very fortunate now to have a whole cadre of genetic counselors at 
uh, at my cancer center um, in Dallas. Um, and so I, I think that you know having that um, ability to refer and say, hey, you know, this might be a good option to at least look and, and think about germline testing um, to have that available. Uh, I don't know if we have, you know, is there anything that we didn't cover? Well, you know, I, I'll ask a question to you, Tony. It's, it's actually for somebody very special in the audience. Um, tell me about translocation, RCC. What's your approach there? Because that's something, you know, I think we all you know, sort of struggle with, and you've done a lot of work in that regard. So can you tell us uh, your treatment approach there or what, what in general terms you do? You know, it, it's just it's amazing because translocation, RCC, in, in kids is the second or third most common um, kidney malignancy. But in adults, and here by I mean 80, 20 years or higher, it's a bit of a different biology. It's not the most common. It's top maybe seven or eight. Uh, translocation RCC is defined by, you know, translocation involving chromosome 11 and, um, uh, chromosome, sorry, X um, at the position at P11 mostly, although there's a lot of, you know, forms of translocation as, as uh, you can know. Usually, from clinical, it has been a predominance of uh, women and that are in their 30s and uh, 40s. And in the past, relying only on uh, histology, um, these tumors under the microscope look like clear cell papillary or clear cell plus papillary okay. until, you know, genomic testing and uh, cytogenetics at that time before that became more common and we saw that translocation. Luckily, I work with our chief of GU pathology, Michelle Hurst, who has an interest in kidney cancer. So she looks at the, at the charts and see if, you know, this is a woman, young, et cetera. This looks a bit different. And a lot of these actually patients were labeled clear cell because if you go back to the TCGA, which that was not in translocation RC in papillary chromophobe and clear cell, you can take many cases. I think we had up to 10 or less. Um, uh, that end up having the translocation because you have, you know, RNA-seq and all these data on. So we looked at these patients. We looked at our patient too, at the available, um, you know, data. And, and, and to be honest with you, what we found is a tumor that is really driven by the translocation. There isn't much there uh, going on. There could be some hot tumor microenvironment. We have shown, we looked at databases for patients on clinical trial, like the Emotion uh, 150 trial and others, and we looked at our own Harvard uh, data set, and we worked with Srini Viswanathan, Eli Van Allen, Ziyad Bakuni, and we showed that there could be more uh, of this patient responding to immune checkpoint inhibitor. Then the French uh, MD Anderson uh, cohort came that it's really maybe, maybe that the responses are heterogeneous, so it's challenging. We're working with uh, scientists uh, on it. And, and I think now we covered everything. Thank you again. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash TJS860. This educational activity is supported through medical education grants from Aveo Pharmaceuticals Incorporated, Bristol Myers Squibb, Azi Incorporated, Exelixis Incorporated, and Merck and Company Incorporated.